Welcome everybody. Good morning to everybody on the West Coast and good evening for some of the European people that signed in. Uh, welcome to the DMA Salon, the online lecture series of the Design Media Arts Department at UCLA. <laughs> the University of California, Los Angeles occupies the ancestral, traditional and contemporary lands of the Tongva and Shimas peoples. I am Henry Lucas. I organized this lecture on typography in motion or type for the screen. Um, we have two uh, guests from who are both in Europe right now. Uh, Daniel Marlefeld is in Amsterdam and Mitz Peoni is in Geneva, Switzerland. So both speakers will present for 45 minutes. And uh, after that, there's half an hour for Q and A. Um, let me introduce the first guest to you. Hold on for a minute. Daniel Marlefeld is a graphic and motion designer based in Amsterdam. Since 2007, he has been running an independent practice with a strong interest in generative design and kinetic typography. Um, recently, his practice has shifted more towards code-based motion design. And in addition, addition to his design practice, he has taught at the Gerald Rietveld Academy and Artes University of the Arts in Arnhem, uh, where I actually used to study. We've met a couple of times at um, Arnhem, the academy, when I was visiting, and we um, both were in a group show together curated by John Sueda in San Francisco. Daniel. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the, uh, for the invite and for the nice introduction. So I uh, st uh, start sharing my screen. Is that uh, good? Yeah, go ahead. Let's see, I'll start sharing my desktop. Oh, um, I'll check if I... Check those two boxes, yes. All right, here we go. Um, welcome everybody. Thanks for the, Henry for the nice introduction and invite. Uh, I was speaking about generating typography. Uh, I um, will first tell a little bit the history, how I got into this uh, generative design and um, how I sort of got into a sort of endless quest for design methods. Uh, what I like about it, and I want to show some ex uh, experiments that sort of changed my uh, design process uh, of how um, showing it also uh, in a really quick way online uh, changed that, and uh, why I'm switching a little bit more to animation, and what is what is next. I'll get into it. Um, at first, uh, I graduated with a project that's called Penjet. Uh, I made it with uh, Gillian Hagen and Jan Evert. We're building like a regular printer. Just to match the internet. We didn't do it any programming. So it's the printer basically. Uh, and we were sort of trying to sort of get um, results out of it. At first, uh, if you would print a page, it would just have like one giant line of stripes on it. Uh, and we also try to see what would happen if you would uh, uh, add type to it, but the type was totally unreadable. This was uh, American typewriter. It says type it, but you cannot really see what is, uh, what is written there. So we, uh, this limitation was really an inspiration for us to see what we could get out of it. So for instance, here we were mutilating the, um, the Futura and sort of uh, chopping some uh, stems of the A uh, to, to see if sort of we get a sort of uh, typography out of it. Um, if you would print more things on one page, they would sort of stick together and you see sort of that they're sort of uh, unreadable, but there are also some sort of nice results coming out of it. Uh, so we also try to sort of print those pages with a couple of print runs to see if we uh, could uh, get it more readable some examples. 
Uh, and by the experimentation, I slowly also was trying to sort of see what would happen if different angles and are almost was already sort of a bit starting to animate. Uh, funny enough, actually, I uh, sent this poster to Jun Chueda. I think he has it uh, because we, it was in the same group show as uh, Henry was talking about. Uh, and funny enough, this is almost like the first sort of analog animation that I could find when I was making this presentation. Um, we were also asked to apply this on a couple of things. This is for Node Berlin. And then I made some numerals for that. And I kind of really like this working method uh, because sort of this limitation gave sort of a new language where you could sort of do anything uh, and gave you actually quite a lot of freedom. It was also used, for instance, for a Mediamatic uh, Research Initiative, is an uh, initiative that uh, is working with the showing the work of Jean Tengeli, who was also making drawing machines. And Irma Baum made a book for it, uh, using also this this pendiat sort of sort of makes sense on this project. Um, I was also trying to sort of see if it was possible for me to make sort of digital equivalent of this one, uh, and then I made a typeface based on uh, um, a certain technique that fills the letter uh, for the diplomas of this year. And I made actually a lot of experiments with it. Um, but at the end, for this diploma, I could only pick one, um, one outcome. So I thought it was really a pity. So I already also made a booklet with a lot of different experiments next to it. Um, and this is actually coming from the Penjet that I was also playing with the counter shape and that the whole page was sort of uh, making the shape inside of the letters. Um, but at the end, it became a printed object. And this is, for instance, a design that uh, I made for Irma Baum for design in the elastic mind. It was an exhibition about technology and design. And in this case, I could. Uh, really sort of uh, use those experiments. This was for an exhibition in the MoMA. Uh, but uh, it was almost motion, but I still had to check, check one frame. So I want to show a little bit what I was actually seeing on my screen it was a little bit like this. But I never really thought of sort of a way to to uh, to animate it. I, I made actually some animations with it, but I never showed it somehow. And recently, I thought, yeah, it's maybe a pity. It's maybe nice to do something with it. So I made some type experiments also with this, um, and somehow this combination. Uh, of this penjet and this uh, diploma typeface sort of gave me a sort of um, quest that I thought I cannot just use a, a, a regular typeface. I should do something with a sort of system that I have to uh, use so that I can make endless different variations also to find sort of new shapes and to explore this. I, I was really excited about this. And it took me quite a while. I was sort of endlessly uh, playing around with this, uh, this, this, this concept, but I uh, also had to really sort of spend a lot of time into sort of get this working method going. It took really a couple of years to sort of to, to practice this. So here I'm gonna show like a, a couple of animations that I uh, made uh, last couple of two years. Uh, and there, some of them are really based on sort of this uh, experiments that I did before, but never really, uh, animated, but I always used still. So this endless searching for sort of new shapes um, is sort of really embedded in me. Uh, and um, I noticed that most of the time, um, this experiments later somehow get a purpose or not, but you sort of build a, a giant database of sort of shapes and visual languages that maybe one they will come, come in handy. I don't uh, use so much colors, but uh, have a small 
color versions next to it. Um, for instance, like one uh, technique that I was really looking into was, this, for, for instance, the reaction diffusion system. Uh, that is a system, an algorithm um, uh, invented by uh, Turing. Um, and this the same system is also working in Photoshop. So the, the way I was sort of making this kind of animations were really sort of using actions and the, the limitations of Photoshop. And it was, and it was nice. It was a nice outcome, but it would uh, really, uh, yeah, take a lot of time before you you got something. So I was also trying to see what it would do to type and making this like one of the first animations that I sort of tried. And so all this, this animations were just made in Photoshop. I was also trying color variations with it. So I really like this design method, but I was not really into programming yet. And when I discovered that, then I was really sort of could use all the knowledge that I sort of uh, learned from sort of all these experiments. So this is, for instance, something that I made uh, in a was was playing with with uh, in a workshop with uh, Jus van Rossum in Drawbot. And I was applying the same principle of this uh, Alan Turing of the uh, reaction diffusion. And I was sort of uh, playing with the numbers with it. Uh, in this case, I was um, putting vector files in and uh, actually uh, making them bitmap again, and then put a lot of actions over it. And just by sort of playing with the numbers, you could just animate his life. This is just playing with, uh, it's like the numbers in the codes. And at the end, I could sort of stop at like the perfect setting and then I could animate this. Uh, what I also really like is that you sort of can make endless variations and you can sort of yeah, pick or maybe not, don't even pick, just show the whole bunch of uh, variations. This is for instance, like a, a letter where I just animate uh, uh, on. And by uh, sort of animating, it sort of creates uh, interesting patterns. Here sort of made a still by, like by just having like a formula and this, this typeface, you can just make like endless variations. And I really like this effect about uh, generative design. What I really also like is that you sort of can really get surprised by the outcome, you sort of play with it and, and if you sort of find the, the right angle, you really can, uh, can discover a sort of new visual language. For instance, here I show a couple of sketches that I sort of used throughout the year, throughout the years that I really are fascinating with how the computer is sort of uh, is limited. If you have, uh, for instance, like a gradient with a grayscale and you try to ditter it, it really has to pick like the, yeah, what, what's gonna be black and what is gonna be white. And uh, over here, you can also see that uh, it also makes mistakes with it. And I always really like those, those mistakes. I, I was really try to search for those mistakes and, uh, and sort of emphasize on those mistakes and, and show them. Because I think that's sort of the, the handwriting of the, of the computer. I sort of, um, almost forced the computer to take creative decisions, or actually at least that's my goal. So for instance, there are some experiments that I made it with this principle. I was also looking at type and how I could use this principles on type. So I made like a lot of different uh, tryouts with it. And now with this notion, I also, Notice that I can also use this kind of principles on how I make animations, or you can, uh, with all those software based limitations, um, are, are like almost the same in every program. And in every program, it can be used in a different way. Um, I, let's see, I uh, really like also the fact uh, before. I was always sort of um, 
just making an experiment and I waited for uh, the moments to uh, to use it or like uh, I, I just put my experiments in in a folder and I thought if somebody else sees it he's going to steal it and I'm I, I, will, I will have to be really protective about it I'm not going to show it and uh, I have to apply it when there's a nice opportunity for it um, so my typical design process would be like this I get a design brief I make a lot of tryouts I find a limitation within the many lim limitations of the of the assignment. The client likes it or hates it, and if the client hates it, I put it in a folder and I don't show anyone else. And I hope that there would be a, a way to sort of uh, use it someday because I was really enthusiastic about it. But uh, and then repeat it. So there's there's like a lot of sort of work with it and. Um, it's also, it can, can be quite tough to sort of find a nice match with a sort of generative design and, and, a, and a nice uh, client to, to, to use it with. And I noticed that now that I share a lot of more experiments, uh, sometimes my design process is more like this. I make sort of a design, an experiment without any restrictions. And I uh, add, I'm, it's free work, so I didn't apply it for any, anybody. And then somebody asked me to apply, apply it. It's also, for instance, the case with some animations that I made for, for clients. I really like the fact that uh, somehow that you already come up with certain visual languages and uh, that people really think like, oh, really, I like this. I get enthusiastic about it. Uh, that gives somehow so much freedom to, to, to design. This is also another experiment that I made in Drawbot. Uh, and this is actually, I uh, got asked to use it for an editorial design for the Washington Post. So somehow uh, also in designs for, uh, for online magazines or newspapers, you always have to react really fast. So then it's really good to sort of have uh, a little bit of experience or like uh, knowledge about different ways and how, how they can animate. Um, how I'm slowly, um, slowly uh, sort of starting to uh, switch to animation, I will explain this now. Um, for instance, I have a client called Cross Council Nederland, and for them, I made actually an identity also really based on generative design. Of I always try to sort of see to generate a lot of different uh, uh, typefaces for them, and some other identity is uh, like. Um, a little bit like the the search for the identity, so that it's, it's sort of never finished. So every time I I add on it, there's, there's always a sort of new layer on it. And uh, in this types, I always could really sort of experiment with how much different solutions I could find, and it's sort of really linked to also my working method somehow. Um, and I slowly also started to see, like, to try out different settings and to see if I could animate those kind of letters in those experiments. Um, and I noticed when I was making this presentation also that I, in my work, there were a lot of things that were really sort of almost animations, but then printed on paper. <laughs> this was also one design I made for, for a poster. And later on, I thought ah, I have to sort of find a way maybe to, to animate this, this design. This is also like an, a design for a poster that I made. And later, later I thought nah, I can go back to that and see if I can, can made it, make it or code it. Uh, because there's a lot of logic behind my designs, uh, I noticed, because uh, I only recently got started with this animation part, that I am, um, um, uh, it's everything I make is sort of so logical build up that it's that you can also really make variations or animations from it. This is, for instance, the birth card for my second daughter. And then I made it in, in other software, but then I was experimenting with it and actually I could quite easily animate it also. 
So I was also going back to my archives and all those experiments and to see if there was sort of a way I could use it or approach it in a, in a different way. Um, what I see is that in um, the most of my designs uh, that I did before, um, I was always um, only making like a couple of letters. And I, I really want to sort of see if I can uh, switch more to, to making like total typefaces. One of the example is, that for, is the purple haze. It's an experimental typeface I uh, made based on um, one letter I actually made for 36 days of type of my friend uh, Edgar Walker, who uh, organized Letter Space, sort of a lecture series in, in Amsterdam. And he invited like a lot of different um, designers to make a variable font. And a variable font uh, is a font that can scale from different axes. So you can um, have two different sizes of a font and you can scale between them. And uh, he asked all the different designers to make one font. And um, I was actually really thinking of a method I was already want to make. Uh, and I proposed this. in the logic of a variable font. So we were trying, but it was not really matching. So then I thought I should do what I do normally, that I sort of re really think within the limitations of what, what is uh, variable fonts can do. Um, so what is one thing what really works in variable fonts is that you can uh, play with shapes and counter shapes or like the, the that's, that's one thing that you can declare in, in, in font language. So I thought, how can, can I take this approach to like a, des, a design or for a font? Uh, I tried a lot of different things with this, this principle, but I ended up sort of cutting the shapes in each other. Like they're sort of uh, making a new pattern. This was the, the variable font the variable nine that I made for this, uh, this project. And this were some other experiments that I made for this, this typeface. Uh, and now I actually uh, starting to develop also together with my uh, uh, intern at the moment, uh, Brigitte van Eyck. She also helped me with uh, is finalizing or getting this font ready. So here you can see that if with a slider, you can uh, adjust the type and it's sort of, uh, when it's getting bigger, it's becoming a totally different font. This is still a work in process, but I want to show it anyway. Um, and what's next, I uh, was thinking, what, how can I use this, this font? And I would really like, uh, this is the next step, but I re would really like to make this font Um, one other experiment that I also really uh, noticed by uh, making uh, font experiments is that I uh, found a lot of ways to generate uh, impossible typefaces. Here are a couple of uh, experiments from it. Uh, and these are all uh, actually made in paper yes uh, i got uh, some help from uh, jonathan pucky the, the the founder also from uh, paper yes he made uh, an online coding platform um, with jörg leni where you could really uh, right away in the browser can see what you do uh, and i really like the fact that you could um, really intuitively uh, directly could see what you were doing and that really sort of uh, changed my approach 
uh, also to code to coding because I could really sort of uh, see and, and sort of tweak the settings and you sort of made almost like a program in this coding language and then you could really sort of play around with this uh, this, this this language. Um, I was also asked a lot to uh, play around with this um, uh, this fonts, uh, but it was still also quite a process because um, I would with one of the design to really get it right, to tweak it, I would uh, maybe uh, spend a half day or uh, sometimes quicker, but uh, I put quite some time into it. I, I, made, I made the codes, I rendered it, and then I, uh, and, and if I didn't like it, I went back again and I rendered it again. So uh, lately I'm really sort of thinking or dreaming, so uh, how can I sort of take this approach a little bit further? So I am, uh, only recently sort of trying to to see if I can um, automate this process a little bit further. If, if it's possible, if I can um, uh, actually um, coach uh, typefaces and to see if it's possible to, to really uh, coach the whole alphabet or that you sort of uh, change one aspect of the letter and that you can sort of in immediately sort of export the whole typeface. So together also with Brigitte, my internet moments, I'm, I'm investigating this, this subject because I really think this will take this experiments uh, to a next level and will be much more useful uh, for me also uh, than just letter forms. And I can uh, really sort of see uh, the new way of how to um, to apply this. So I'm sort of at the beginning of this and I'm really sort of thinking what kind of things I can implement. So uh, this is also one part that we just implemented is uh, to see if it's possible that I can, you can draw all the letters. This one has a little bit of a link to the the purple haze typeface, um, but I uh, really want to um, change all the settings so in such a way that I can uh, really change one aspect of the font and then a really new uh, way comes out of it or a new, uh, new typeface. And these are some examples, for instance, what I can try to build with this system. I also started on uh, making like the whole alphabet wizard. What I really notice is that um, normally in my practice, you don't really have time to sort of um, really put so much time into to, uh, this experiment. So it's always sort of sides, side notes. Uh, so uh, for this product, I also really wanna see if there's a way to, to really execute this layer, to see if you sort of make your own software to, uh, to layer on, design a lot of different uh, things. So in this case, I'm, I really wanna take some time off uh, to invest in uh, sort of optimizing this 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 uh, working approach, so I can make much more um, animations in in a shorter time. And you can react fast on uh, on the design you want to want to make. These are some other examples that I could make with the with this system. And I also really want to explore the way sort of this works uh, uh, to see if, it's, if there's a possibility that I can uh, maybe type in also in the software to see uh, what are the next steps that I can, can take. Um,
Did you unshare your screen, Daniel? Not sure what's happening, um, Daniel, you there? Yeah, I'm here, yeah. <laughs> Did you unshare your screen? I think I don't see my screen shared anymore, but. Uh, could you could you try sharing it again, Daniel? Oh yeah, something went wrong. Huh? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay. I, I didn't unshare it. I think it went automatically. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Sorry, I think I got a little bit too quick in the, on the first part. <laughs> uh, I'm not seeing your screen share right now. Are you sharing again? No, no, I, I, I unshared it. Oh, you unshared it. Uh, do you, can you try and share it so that you can finish yeah. the slides? Do you see the screen? Yes. And was was there a, a problem with the slide? Uh, did you see didn't see the last slides? Uh, I don't think we did. We see thanks. I don't think I saw thanks. Um, oh, oh, but it looks like it looks like your it looks like your program shut down it's crashed. It's just crashed. at the end. <laughs> Once, once again? Uh, I was just saying it looked like the program closed just at the very end of your presentation. So it was perfect timing. OK, perfect. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Daniel. That was great. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. I'm sorry I rested a little bit too much. <laughs> no worries. All right, so now um, I'm presenting Mitz Peoni, who's a partner and creative director of New York and Geneva-based agency DIA Studio, which specializes in corporate and cultural visual identity systems, graphic design, and typography. Um, Mitch is in Geneva right now, where he's um, teaching and working. And um, take it away, Mitch. Sounds good. Thank you for uh, the invite. And uh, it's really, really nice to uh, be involved in this. And Cool checking out Daniel's stuff too. Some really interesting stuff that made me want to get in that software and play with it. So, but anyway, um, yeah, so I'm, I got a lot to share, but I'm going to go through stuff pretty fast. Um, but uh, a lot of the, uh, I kind of want to talk about kind of what the reason why we do what we do, um, or even, you know, why I even got interested in this stuff, and then kind of go through a very wide range of different experimental or client stuff as well um so let me just get into it so yep um dia studio i'm the partner with my wife and actually started the studio back in 2008 but uh partner and creative director so So um, just to start, I kind of want to show that piece by it's Wayne Shorter, Brian Blade, John Patitucci um, um, on the drums. And it's actually one of my favorite, favorite jazz groups. But to think about the studio and the way that we work is very much compared to trying to prepare ourselves to perform as in like improvising and then sort of discovering or iterating in time. So this idea of the studio is around, or even you know the practice is about this idea of input 
improvise. So pretty much everything leading up that point in time until you create, and then the output is the results. Um, so, and I think, you know, as I've sort of, you know, not gotten older, I'm not old, but uh, as I have actually aged, you realize there's a lot more in, that goes involved into this work than, than just the, the technique and mechanics and the, you know, the typical design stuff. But I think there's actually a lot more that actually you can bring into it. So, you know, whether it's life experience, other interests that are outside of the, this, the field you're in that kind of blend in and kind of give you a position of why you do things. And I think, you know, for me, that's really, really important. And, and that kind of musical aspect I'll talk about a little bit is really highly influential in how, how we work as a studio and, you know, how I sort of developed sort of our creative position as well. Um, and and I, the cycle is, so you, you kind of make things, but it's, I think it's kind of an interesting thing that they really is a separation between this like critical point of view, the process, and then the making of the process. So it's kind of this feedback loop essentially, but, but ultimately it's trying to get in this position where we can just improvise and make stuff with not worrying about anything, but just trusting ourselves getting into that from everything before. But uh, so I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the input. Um, and like I said, that's everything other than the design or, and some design stuff, but before I show the actual results, but just to start, so I was talking earlier before we started, um, we're spread out all over the, this is the core team, but we're spread over all over the world. Right now, Deanna, designer in New York, Daniel is actually kind of roving around Europe somewhere. I don't know where he is. We just check in with him on Zoom. And then Megan and I are in Geneva right now. We actually formally closed all of our brick and mortar office spaces uh, two years ago before we relocated to Switzerland. So um, our office is actually managed completely remotely and, and has been for quite some time, even before the pandemic started. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, there's Meg and I, there's the four of us when we were working in New York. Um, and then there's Layla, our, uh, our, our, our dog. So she's super important in the studio. Um, but I think more importantly, uh, while if you're familiar with our work, there's you know pretty large scale projects being done. Um, so I mean, obviously, if the the core team of four people that do most of the work, um, it's important that we think of collaborators and other people that are very specialized in specific areas that can come in and work with our team to generate stuff. So, and here there's type designers, you know, generative artists, illustrators, animators, sort of come together and work on things very specifically. So at any given time, the studio can be much bigger in its personnel, but really the core team is the one that's responsible for developing all the concepts of the work. Um, so to get into this, um, I just wanna talk a little bit about my personal background. Um, so I actually, you know, music is actually probably the most influential part in our design practice. So I've been playing piano since I've been about, and I started playing when I was five um, and over time started to take it really seriously. And I discovered the music of Herbie Hancock and, and Wayne Shorter when I was in um, in high school. And I, and I realized at that point, I was like, you know, rather being forced to take lessons, I was like, I really want to do this. So hearing that and being inspired by their art really kind of kicked me into this like overdrive of something that I wanted to take a lifelong quest in. And I think what's interesting, like getting into that music, also getting interested in the design and the record covers at that time, you could see, you know, the, the, the covers of Blue Note and ECM records. Like I was kind of consuming this stuff when I was super young. Um, so this interest of, you know, typography and, and graphic design was really, really happening at the same time, kind of in, in, in conjunction parallel to the music. So at that, at that early age, there very much was this, like, I have this music component and this design interest that ran side by side. And, and I think that set the foundation for everything that we sort of do, even now as a studio and how those things come together and mix. Um, be playing an impromptu gig in Russia, actually. So, but enough of that. Um, just want to, I talk, people always say like, oh yeah, you know, designs are musicians. Like, no, I actually take mu music as serious as I do as design. So I still practice every day. But anyway, I kind of want to talk about this understanding of what we see as identity and like what kind of combines a thing to kind of give it a certain aesthetic. And this is when I was saying earlier that it's more than just like the visual things, the, you know, the type, the color, the whatever. It's like, there's a lot more to it that comes together to give a very specific thing. So the zebra is a good example. It's like, 
through evolution, it's kind of transformed through different genuses of horses. And just because of this very specific place in Africa, it, just the conditions, the place, the evolution, everything, all these things that came together to create this very unique animal at that very specific thing. So the, right away, you want the, what it eats, the sun, the, the terrain, all these other things that come together that develop that. So this idea that you know, the way we create design is not is really a collection of intersecting points coming to the work. And, you know, as a traditional designer, we're looking at, you know, layouts, posters, books, and stuff like that. But if we start to think about screens and movement, there's a lot more that we can start to think of conceptually um, that can influence in the work. So this kind of phrase is the studios kind of embodied over the last I think four or five years, this idea that motion and movement can actually be the signifier of the identity. So, you know, for example, you saw, you know, how the horse is running and I'll show it to you. The, the movement of the horse is very unique to the horse or the movement of me walking is very unique to me. The movement of a caterpillar is very unique to the caterpillar. So those are things that we can understand as a human that we can draw influence and think about. Um, so to break this down, I mean, there's, you know, physics, you know, just rules of nature govern how things move, essentially, whether it's going to feel natural or mechanical, um, you know, gravity and, you know, magnetism and all this different stuff. And, and, you know, all these different forces give a certain sort of quality and gesture of movement that's, that's really interesting. And, and then I think when we get into this idea of things being programmatic or generative, and that you can really borrow a lot of influence from these real things and actually, you know, boil it down to very simplified sort of formulaic examples of trigonometry and, and generate these sort of behaviors through that. So, so the system that moves gives it its sort of uh, character or behavior is really derived from something quite natural, actually. It isn't necessarily have to be so technical, you know. And then you, you kind of expand on this, like you have the, the components in nature, then there's biomechanics and how things move in structure. So I think this is a cool piece by Edward Mybridge. It's like an early uh, looping sequence of just a horse running. And I find this really cool because I can see this in any form. So let's say this is a poster, um, uh, like a, a poster series, you know, and you have each different image thrown all over the city, but you know, it's the exact same thing. It's a horse and, and, and you have like the jockey on the back, but the formally every poster has a nice dynamic energy because it's captured and sort of brought, the time is brought into the piece. So there's a visual consistency, but there's also a flexibility because you're allowing motion within this structure of the horse and it's sort of character rigging, so to speak, that give its identity. And I think this is a really fascinating way of thinking about, you know, composing work or creating work. So, and again, these things can be formula, formulaic and brought into very specific animation systems. And, you know, and, and, and then once you start to think about this, there, there comes so much reference and so many things that you can like, oh, how does this move? How does that move? How does, has it, how does, it, how does like a, a cat move or elephant move or whatever? I mean, these things all have their own sort of gesture or character that can ultimately sort of inspire some sort of movement. And I think when you start to abstract you know, even scientific research out of this, you start to see really beautiful graphic forms come out of this, you know, these really sort of organic shapes that feel like they're alive and moving, but you don't even need to have the, the body of the, the creature or wherever it comes from anymore. It becomes just about the sort of underlying structure, the underlying mechanics of it. Um, and I find this just a really, really fascinating territory to think about from a graphic design perspective. So for example, this is pretty early, but you know, just look at the physics of this cat caterpillar and the biomechanics of that, and then letting that actually, you know, approach a way I would animate type in a certain way, play with the tracking, play with the, the gesture of the text to then mimic that in a certain way to give it sort of this naturally flowing thing. Um, and and it's very simple. I mean, these don't need to be complex animations at all. It just, I think it's just intentional and just bringing that sort of thing into sort of an abstracted realm using text or design elements. So these are pretty early. I think these are like three or four years old now, but this was part of a period of time in the studio where we were doing a lot of research, just combining motion behaviors with techniques of typography and seeing what would happen. Like, so what was nice is that we didn't know what the expected result was going to be. Um, we just, brought this behavior into the text and then it just gave us this result. So very much a generative approach of design, but we weren't using code or we weren't using uh, um, like, 
you know, processing or any of these coding languages, this is all done using animation software, but thinking of that within like a more of a programming mindset. Um, so I think it gets more interesting is when we think of that humans can be creative with a mechanics. So, you know, bringing my music background in, you think about different genres of music that connect to certain rhythms and music with create certain dances. And I think there's a lot of interesting stuff here of just where beats and rhythms and, and kind of this rhythmic quality of animation can come to life that can really be inspired by music and culture. Um, so this is, a, this is a dance in New Orleans called the Sex Line Dance. The one before was Liquid Dance from the 90s and like, you know, uh, London rave culture. And then even ballet too sort of has a connection to the rhythmic structure of the music. So you are starting to see from an influence standpoint that dance, rhythm, music, choreography, all of this other thing can come back into the graphic design process and be sort of recreated in that environment and give a certain quality. And I think we think about choreography and dance, even when you hold a still image from a, a dancer or a ballet, someone doing ballet, it's always quite beautiful because the, the, there's so much tension and care brought into the, the, the movement. So you can work in and out of still and movement like continuously. Um, and ultimately like a Jabberwocky is a good example. You can see them sort of syncing up with the sound. Turn this up a little bit. So now taking that same philosophy and just bringing it right into the animation process. So the, these are like early tests, just using kind of promotional material talks and stuff like that. But like trying to see like, can we bring in this like, you know, rhythmic danceable quality into the, into the typography, into the design, and also have it affect the, the formal relationship of how it works. And then the more that goes in, the more research we kind of dug into. So there's a lot of artists that have looked into this over the years. This is a piece by John de Cesare trying to do a kind of a visual interpretation of a Bach piece or Beethoven piece. And then there's some other things about, this is lab notation. This is a, actually notation for dancing. Um, really, really interesting looking at this from a perspective of a graphic designer. And you can see the system underneath there that could generate sort of forms. Um, even the, these examples are so beautiful, but like that, they were never intended for like, you know, as a graphic design artistic exercise. It's very functional um, form, formulas to like help you know, show dancers. Like I could see this thing on the right be, being a type typographic exercise. Um, so just getting into this and thinking about this and seeing this material, you really know that there's just a lot of ways to consider this as a possibility as we work creatively. This is a futurist piece by Giacomo Bala, even sort of irreverent versions of capturing motion. Um, and just, you can see here, even just like the, the energy that's left in the frame, in, in, in the capture, it's, 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 it's got a lot of tense sort of quality. And I think that's really fascinating as, as a design piece, whether it moves still or static, that it, there is this sort of dynamic quality in the work. Um, so a piece by Baldessari, um, some Cindy Sherman stuff. And so here's an example of a piece that we did. So this thing on the right was completely just a capture out of something that we created, generated. And we were just like, well, that's our favorite, our favorite composition out of I think, you know, the thing is that so you have your frame rates divided by the amount of seconds that you have. So, you know, if I have one second, I have 30, 30 options essentially for a composition if it's a looping thing. Um, so the, again, creating, using animation to be, have a generative process to it, it's really interesting. So, so that's a kind of a bulk of research kind of syncing up of why we make things move and it comes out of, uh, you know, you know, music, choreography, understanding physics and nature and all that stuff. But like now, as we talk about where design is living, um, we're pretty much at this state where we're like minority port. I'm, you know, like everything's going to be screen. I mean, we have like banner ads that are so hyper-focused to us in marketing. And I know this is probably like a bad thing, but the context of graphic design has shifted because of the way we consume content. Um, this is funny. So like the... The hot dog guy was already like hip to this. They were been doing like animated type and stuff. And this is all coded in there. Um, but sort of using different formats dictates how we end up understanding design. And I think we have to evolve the way we approach these things and these problems to manage where the content's being served. Um, and we were talking about earlier, it's, it's not just a book anymore. I mean, it's just a multitude of formats, shapes, options, AR, VR, you name it. We have to think about the context of this. Um, so, 
you know, the animation and generative ways and, and you know, you just thinking about the screen and generally general puts us in a whole new sort of area of understanding how design works. So, and I, I kind of compare this is quite interesting back into music. So, I mean, what we have to do, and I think what Daniel just showed really well is that you creating your own software or creating your own instruments in a way to be creative with them. So it, it's not about necessarily the end result anymore. It's more about the system that can be done. And this is, this is quite fascinating music. Um, and I like to use this analogy. It's like the piano has always had the same keys for, for a thousand years with like an organ. The organ had its sound, then a harpsichord is developed on the same system of the keys. But the harpsichord can only play one volume level. So then we had to transform the harpsichord into the piano. So then we could have sort of a, a different um, dynamic range, play soft, play loud. And then, you know, technology started to come in the 70s, you know, synthesizers and all kinds of different stuff that we could kind of tweak and produce sounds. We still have the keyboard. Um, and then eventually, and this is like in the 90s, then we started to move to hardware. So then we're starting to, to, to kind of completely lose any traditional classical position of creating music. We can kind of do it with anything, remixing stuff. And now we can be completely in a software environment to do whatever. And, and as a trained musician, I was maybe not receptive to this at first, but I mean, I don't think there's any rules anymore. Like if you can create powerful work using any kind of assets and tools at, at hand, then go, go for it. Some, and you don't need to be a classically trained pianist to do that. So moving that back into the design process, this is a little piece we did for Squarespace um, before the rebrand about three, four years ago, we worked with Zach Lieberman on this, just creating this kind of generative uh, uh, typographic poster thing. Um, and this is, I can get into that, and this is actually some of my tests kind of using open framework. So I don't do a little code, I'm not the best, but the idea is I understand the, the thinking behind how these work. So it's very easy for me to collaborate people that are like way, way, way better than me at that. Um, and here's some other stuff in JavaScript for the Squarespace rebrand, but I'm going to fly through this because I want to be sensitive to time. So earlier we had a little discussion about thinking about traditional things. Um, um, I'm also a type designer on a classical sense. So there's kind of this other counterpoint where I do this, I call it the slow design that you don't work on a font for like five years, um, but then you do very fast stuff using tools and generating work and stuff. So here's just some examples of some fonts that I've drawn. And I think this is really important for me to work in this very contemporary context because this has taught me a sensitivity to negative space and understanding of formats and scale and all this kind of craftsmanship skill um, that I otherwise would not have had understood just going straight into the technological side of the design. So having this kind of fusion of like a very traditional point of view and understanding even type design, it's sort of fundamentals, bringing that into a context of, you know, this fast moving screen based work has been really, I think, helpful for me. Um, so anyway, so I'm just going to fly through this. So this kind of mix all that stuff up, you know, um, kind of gives you a little bit of the inside of how we work. And this becomes sort of an average day at the studio. We really don't like to meet much and talk about things. It's just like head down and just create as much based on whatever brief we're working on at the time. Just going to kind of fly through this. This is a older piece actually. So this is a, this example of actually designers work, I think within a six hour period. So it's like almost taking the, the extreme of not only do we use tools, but ourselves actually become so focused on being iterative and save as making new things, making new things really fast. And then we can just like push through as much work as possible in a short period of time. So then we can take the next day to reflect on what we make. And I think it's important that you know, I'm not necessarily being too critical about what's being made in the spot that, that kind of has to come after. So it's all about the separation between sort of making and reflecting, making, reflecting, and just producing fast and a lot of iterations. Um, so then ultimately this became sort of this generative shape um, of color that we use throughout the identity. There was an application to do that and you could create different assets and how this went into the actual visual identity as well. Um, but this is before we really started to use a system, this kind of thinking in type until this project came up. Um, this is a track. So we had to do an hour's worth of live visuals um, that was all typographic. And then we had, I think, like two or three days to do that. So for those of you who aren't traditional animators, they would know that that's impossible to make that much 
different variables of work in that short a period of time. So we essentially had to figure out ways to hack existing software like After Effects or Cinema 4D to then generate um, these animations through little systems that we've built in there. So then ultimately we're easily could create 10 second animations just by adding text, hitting render, using some setup that we had to toolkit it. So we were able to create a very large volume of work. And this is a bit old, like looking at this now, I mean, it's kind of funny, but it, it did kind of change our speed and how we work and how we approach work because of this, um, the brief on this. Some stuff there. And then, yeah, and also, you know, if you were to go to like a DJ show, that's not the most exciting thing to watch a DJ jump around. So you have to have like 80 feet, like letters, <laughs> scanning of them behind them and stuff. So this is at Lollapalooza, so that was kind of cool. But, and here's, some, and also taking the same principles. So we actually created these record covers just by pulling stills out of a lot of animation. So that became, you know, started to become a way that we worked. It was just kind of working from the system that we would develop and just exporting and generating the stills to be the final output. So it's kind of moves. So here's some more examples of this kind of stuff. And what we realized is like, once we did one thing, then there's some commissions would come in to sort of produce more of that. Um, this is the Secret Sevens project for uh, Squarespace. And here's some, so this other people like publicly were just making these from this system too. So they were just exporting these kind of abstract typographic pieces. Um, and here's some stuff here. This is like an exhibition where they made their thing and printed it, put it up. Um, but I think for, for me, the issue was is that work was very decorative and it felt, I think felt like um, you know, illustration of type, you know? So I think what the next level was, how can we start to fuse this combination of dealing with content and typographic hierarchy, but also bringing animation in there. And then now you can see these are tests that were done thinking about this rhythmic quality in the work that I was talking about earlier. Um, so you see a lot of like, you know, almost time signatures built into it, like two, four, three, four, four, four time signatures, very rhythmic. Um, it has this kind of danceable quality into the animation, which has been very kind of central to a lot of the stuff that we do. And then just, then we just started just making all kinds of stuff, some tests for some AR, doing some crazy type specimen stuff, just playing with that. Uh, this is like an early test. We're just, just messing around. I mean, like what happens if you start to play with stuff on a dumpster? So these became prototypes for AR stuff. And I think what we realized during this is that, that we had to start to think about typography differently because all of a sudden we weren't set to a fixed format. So where does type live in space? Um, so that became a bit of an interesting thing. Um, and this is a piece we did for Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver. So then, yeah, you have to build these like structures and type tracked into space some way. Like how do you deal with layouts and, and content hierarchy like that when you don't have just the, the rectangle essentially. Um, just some more tests, this is using Unity. Then, so you see like then the face can be like a, a format for text, like then just seeing where this possibly could live and how you could sync it up with stuff without having to be in the format was something that we were very interested in. Um, these are some sort of generative tests, just kind of letting it go. And you can create these kind of really expressive compositions and then going, just taking, you know, like dropping a marble in a bowl, but having text on it. Uh, magnetism sort of applied to text. Gravity applied to text. And there's just a lot of these things. Um, then taking like a, a break, uh, what is it? Like a b-boy, yeah, like the break dancer. And then using the, the mocap positions to put text on that to see what would happen. Actually, the, that was the thing I showed you earlier with the crazy today thing that was next to the MyBridge thing was actually the b-boy uh, dancer that we put all that text to and he created that form. Um, then thinking about like maybe virtual reality situations, but taking more classical position of like Swiss typography and, and grids in the 3D space. Um, using drone cameras as, uh, as tracking data for animation to just like just doing really weird oddball stuff um, to then just see what we could do. So there's just tons of different exploration. And these are a lot of these client projects too. Like this is, this is actually uh, totally done analog um, by like caustic chemicals on, on screens and stuff. Um, let's see, and this is like a, gener a generative thing we did for a, a brand identity, just playing, it was like for a drumming 
lifestyle magazine. So we're playing with the offset of text to mimic sort of rhythmic behavior. So that became sort of the, the defining identity for the visual, for the, the branding. Um, I'm just gonna just zip through this stuff. But you can kind of get the gist and you have this animated system or generative system that then we can edit the text to and then apply them to the work. And then it goes from still, print, interactive. And we try to make sure the touch points become very, very connected in some way. Um, and yeah, this is something we did for a symposium with the MoMA a couple of years ago. So just kind of like trying to move through these different, uh, um, these different sort of formats as much as possible. Again, sort of taking that test through the B-Boy, then we work with Nike. It's like, okay, we can play with running data or basketball data to see what happens with typography. I think you guys get the gist. It's like, what if we put type on this thing that moves and see what happens? Essentially has been like the last five years in the studio, just trying to just do that as much as possible. Um, and then even sort of creating these sort of <clears throat> radical exports for Nike. Um, and this is crazy because this is actually a textile design stuff too. Um, so it ended up being like printed on shirts and stuff. So some more, let's see. There's actually the event where I shoot an air ball. It's not a terrible basketball. Um, and then this is a visual identity for KD11 shoe launch in 2018. So again, you can see the static, the moving and how it sort of transforms. So we build actual tool toolkits where these can be updated really easily on the client side too, so they can input text and generate stills and animation. Um, so this is kind of blown all over the place. Some more sort of experiments, just a lot of different stuff. Some stuff we did for Balenciaga a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a big thing for Johnny Walker. So then. Yeah, you know, the, the formats, especially in the US, these huge screens are places to manage brand content. So, you know, this is a place that the, the work's going to live and and people don't really like look at narrative stuff as many more. They like this textural sort of in between print, but still moving. It's kind of like looping. It's it's it has a very powerful quality to it, I think, for for more commercial level work, too. Um, and kind of wrapping things up on the work. This is something that we did for the London store and Adidas. So we did all the screen animations in there. Um, then the rebranded Squarespace, probably the biggest project that of scale that we did in the last few years. Um, so, and again, this actually, this simple, um, this simple thing, the square in space is the basically the generative concept for everything. So we just play with this idea and see how it impacts everything else. And then we also do a typeface with Francois Rappo here in Switzerland um, based on some of the you know, more of the strategic stuff. But these were the basic behaviors that we used the, the underneath the whole visual identity to then export the work. Um, and here's an example of some mockups, the type. And you can see the type has this kind of edgy quality to it, but kind of subtle. Um, you can see very simply, even on the home page, you see the animation there. Then you can see the generative prints in the, this is in the lobby. Um, and then how this sort of animation behavior starts to actually affect type, dictate type, work as a, a window for images and content has all this flexibility just by using this very simple system. Um, and then we build actual tools internally to, to generate a lot of this work as well. Um, and you can see for us that we could do very radically expressive stuff, but also very functional things as well. So finding that flexibility of how, how wide and crazy and then how sort of minimal and straightforward um, all by using the exact same, just very simple behavior. So in conclusion, uh, this idea of kinetic identity is, you know, we think about the idea of animation behaviors or computation being the means to generate the work. Um, so I think before there's always like, oh, I've make a poster and maybe it should animate and then maybe it should be interactive. And I, I was like, really, now we work in this, it all has to kind of mix. I mean, you, you have kind of a traditional understanding of type, but also, you know, that an anim interaction behavior can affect how the form works and it, it's all messed up. So I think it's kind of embracing this kind of nonlinear way of thinking and, and mixing it together. And, and I find that being a, a really a good, good way to just being really open to stuff. Um, um, and I said earlier, I just moved to Switzerland to study fondue eating. Um, and so I've done, a, I teach it head, but I did a bunch of workshops around. Um, and here's some examples of what I do. So for me, it sounds like. In sort of looking at form and then people having to make sounds related to the form and then move to the form. So really just connecting all the different senses to the work. Here's some outputs of some of the, uh, of the results. All the kids having fun. Um, so 
So yeah, this is a pretty cool thing we did with the master type design at ACAL last year. And now I teach at head, it's cool, school. But anyway, the final thing I want to say is like this idea of being a beginner at everything is really good. Like knowing that you actually suck at something a lot, it keeps you in this like humble place. So, but the only way you're there if you're constantly trying to learn new things. So maintaining that idea. And I think this idea of improvisation is super important because if I'm super concentrated or really in the zone with the work, you don't worry about all this stuff, which ultimately gets in the way of what you could possibly do. So it's really about finding this kind of concentration and, and whatever it takes to get you there, you know, whether it's like sleeping well, not partying and working out and all this extra stuff. But I think it's really important to like get in that state where you can just make stuff. And this is my piano teacher. Uh, it's not a mistake if you play it with conviction. Um, as a jazz pianist, it's true. As long as you can resolve, you can pretty much do anything. And then we did have a lot of resistance in our work as we started. I think it's a lot pretty misunderstood, but I think it's starting to make sense now for people. But if you just stick to it, eventually it takes off. And I think that's a nice metaphor. And to sum it up, I'm going to let these guys say something for us. What, are you trying to relate to them that feeling? What are you, what's your intent? Well, actually, the intent now is to um, uh, throw away and kind of put away everything that was learned, the studied stuff. Uh, again, I always refer because Miles is the only one who would talk like this. He'd say, Wayne, he, he said, hey, Wayne, do you ever feel like you want to play? Uh, he said, you want to play like you don't know how to play? <laughs> and then he said, do you feel like you'd like to play music that doesn't sound like music? That doesn't sound, I know it's right. familiar. And I have a tape of Charlie Parker giving a lesson and the, the, the student says, Mr. Parker, I have to learn all these scales, I have to all, memorize all these scales. And, and Bird said, yes, and after you finish, and you finish learning them, forget them. Right, play as if you don't know all of that stuff are you're not playing a scale but you're playing straight from the heart yeah that's beautiful all right thank you guys appreciate it thanks Mitch. I guess qa time no you're perfectly on time both of you cool. so for everybody if you have questions please put them in the chat um i think i'm going to start with um something I noticed with both of your presentations and maybe um, to my surprise, the, the link to print. Like I feel that both of you are interested in motion, but actually as much interested in the still. Um, can each one of you maybe talk about that a bit in how it's sort of, um, seems to evolve print. It's almost like there's a, a new futurism wave of type. I can say really quick, uh, I think for us, it's very, it's a functional thing because the, the assets that we have to deal with in our clients, we have to dictate all of it. So um, whether it's just sending a still that needs to go on the back of a Facebook page, whether it's a printed piece or an advertisement. But also I think the important thing is, is that to create visual consistency from interaction to motion to print cannot be done if you start with the printed image. It's impossible because you, if you bring print into motion, you have to bring transition devices to bring it on and off. And then if you pause during a transition, you have deterioration in the design. So while, so for us, it's more about creating a consistent thread that can cover all of those outputs. Um, and it's nice because you can just export the still and you're done. You don't have to sit there and slave over the perfect poster because it's already done because you set up a system for it. Um, but yeah, for, it's just more a commercial need too for us. Um, but yeah, I don't know if Daniel might have a different perspective on that too, but yeah, I think it's just a matter of, yeah, of necessity. Daniel, you're muted. Good. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Yeah, for me, uh, I always thought 
uh, a, a sprint was sort of the way you did graphic design somehow. Uh, and uh, and uh, only recently I sort of started to realize like uh, there's quite an, an, a really interesting field in this, this animation what, where there's a lot to discover. So I, for me, actually, I'm so, sort of still discovering at the moment because uh, I'm sort of in the process of shifting somehow <laughs> from from this one field to the other. But I, I like both uh, both fields uh, indeed, but I, I somehow really like the variety that you can bring with animation that I, uh, I, I was, I, I cannot never choose what design I have to pick. So I re I'm really happy with just showing all the possibilities. <laughs> well, you also with the the, the transformation of the type, um, pick moments that are computer generated and, and, and that might su be surprising more rather than having to build it somehow uh, as a still. But yeah, I have a question here from Rolf Huber. Does it bother you that the full scope of these fonts works can only be enjoyed on a screen and not or not fully on paper. What, if anything, gets lost in translation from screen to print? Uh, not, uh, if I can answer the question, it, it doesn't bother me so much. I think, I think actually some of the things can, can work on print, um, but it's, it's just, for me, it's just, Two different rules, uh, sort of uh, different rules apply. Uh, what I don't like about animation is that actually in most of the ways you show it, uh, they you can never really control the quality of it somehow. That really frustrates me. So in prints, you can uh, can go to a really nice printer, and he will really take care of you, and he will make sure it looks looks great. And and the reality with animation is it will end up with shitty compression and nobody can see it the way you see it on your screen. So that's that's really frustrates me. I think my webcam is off, by the way, but uh, I cannot right. turn it on. We can see you. OK, great. Yeah. <laughs> Mitz, can you unshare your screen, maybe? Oh, shoot. I'm sharing still. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no worries. My bad. There we go. And then can you, do you have an answer to this question? Um, I mean, I, I don't work in, rarely work in a situation where print needs to be precious. So I, it, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, and I think it, it's an interesting cultural thing too, because I live in a place now that print is very, very precious, extremely precious. Like people have hundreds of thousands of dollars for budgets for books. So I came from a place that, we never, I never sent an asset off to like Squarespace, for example, huge branding project. I never sent, a, uh, never sent any of that files to print ever. So it was just digital handoff or toolkits or digital files or animations or, or code snippets. So I think for me, it's just the nature of the client work and especially working on like commercial rebranding and stuff, you, you pretty much remove from where the marketing and printing and the advertising goes. So that's handled by other people. So, and it's usually done cheaply and, and it's, yeah, I, but I, I do like even actually yesterday, like I just sent something off. We're doing some silkscreen posters here with the type foundry. And I, I, I actually sent it to the type foundry to manage the process. Cause I got so nervous about like the setup of the files cause I didn't know how to do it. So, and, and they're going to be like, Oh, we have guy to split the colors and make it fine. So I was like, cool. Right, you guys, you solve this problem for me. Yes. <laughs> All right. A question uh, from Nick Rockton. How is type generated with odd time signatures like five slash eight perceived by people without musical background? I, I don't even I mean, I, that's a really good question. And I think it's very interesting because um, I, I do feel that, you know, people who don't know, under, like know music from a theoretical standpoint don't, but we all really enjoy it. So there's, there's, there's things in music that we do understand. So like if a five, eight or like five, four, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one. So you bop, 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 bop. So that you, all you're feeling is just that cadence. So 
Um, what's interesting about this, this is actually an example that I do in my classes where I teach students the difference between clapping on the one and three versus the two and four, one, two, three, four. But if you clap on the one and three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, it's the downbeat. But if I clap on the two and four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, we as humans universally feel that difference in the rhythm. It's a, it is a, it's a known fact that on the two and four, you go up and then you can swing it and do this stuff. So I think if you have a sensitivity of rhythm within the work, it's naturally felt in the animation. I think otherwise it becomes sort of nonsensical and, and uh, there is no rhythm there. There's no sort of pattern that's sort of repeating itself. So um, it doesn't need to be like theoretically understood, but I think it's felt when people watch it, they do feel this. They feel that kind of bounce, that quality and the gesture in there. And I think it's important to be very sensitive to that when you're animating work. So, yeah. Um, all right. I have another question from Silas. Could be Silas Monroe, um, who's a great designer in LA. Can you both speak to the notion of taste and style in your work? Do you have a philosophy for this? Who wants to start? Uh, you can take, start. Um, of, um, funny enough, because uh, I sort of work from a generator, generating design, I, I also really often come up with stuff that I really don't like. <laughs> uh, but uh, I also try to sort of bend a little bit this, this uh, notion that I have of it. So um, sometimes I can find the process interesting, but the outcome not so interesting. And then I'm still going to go through and, and use it uh, because I uh, am sort of excited about the sort of uh, the invention or like the, the method that I made it. Uh, so I, there's also things that I sort of regret later, maybe uh, because they're really sort of made more in a sort of logical sense than, than in a taste sense. But I always start to sort of or stretch these boundaries. Yeah, I feel like this is a loaded question, but I'm gonna do my best at answering it. But uh, so I think there's there's different levels for us. I think the, the client work has, has uh, some certain parameters that we have to manage um, that definitely end up having an influence on the aesthetics or even selection typography and stuff like that. So if I need to create a, a uh, visual identity that needs to work uh, like on hardcore product level on a tech company, but also be expressive and also manage all this typographic content. It right away, there's actually automatically very few like examples of maybe a type choice that I can actually use because of that reason that can function at these levels. So then there, there, these kind of things start to, you know, you have to pick from a smaller pond of material essentially because the quality isn't universally at the level to manage these kind of technical things. Even engineering of a typeface needs to be so high to be able to work inside an application. So then, then you know, all of a sudden there's only like three foundries on the earth that basically have invested in this stuff. So, so, so that, that has a big dictating quality. So then there's another thing when we get into this like animation of text, ripping up text and stuff like that, what I've realized, I think in, in kind of the experimentations of this, the higher quality of material you have to destroy, the better off you are. Because if you have something that's kind of maybe more decorative or has a lot of character or gesture in it, 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 it does so much work for you, then you shouldn't even animate it maybe. So then, then again, all of a sudden, then my library of typefaces that I use would probably be very small again because you're, you're putting more of the, the character and the movement and less the character on the type design. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, and I've, I've been trained the way I sort of studied. I mean, and I'm also in this country too. I come out of this, you know, position of, you know, like caring about the exact letting space and all this crazy shit that really doesn't actually matter. But um, that definitely seeps into my caring and, you know, picking the right type size is really important. So I think that has probably a, some impact on the quality of the work that's produced um, unintentionally sometimes. But, um, but I think ultimately, 
you know, for a branding project, it has to come out of some strategic framework around the content that you're working with to justify why you did that. And then some technical things. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, I think we all have the things we like and we don't like. <laughs> exactly. I have another question from Amy Fang. It's really interesting to see how DS kinetic type is inspired by other sources like jazz music. For the both of you, do you feel like your experimental process flourishes more when it's influenced by the work of other designers, typographers, or it's been more helpful to look outside the field of design? Um, all right. Um, actually, um, I, I, I always felt like I sort of uh, was more sort of intimidated with, with what everything was, what was done before. Like uh, I, on art school, then you always saw like all those great designers and you thought, oh yeah, how can I ever compete with that? So uh, that, in that way, in this sense, I sort of feel like I sort of cheated the system a bit because I, um, uh, in, I sort of come up with a sort of uh, method to work. Uh, what didn't exist yet and there are no rules for it, so I can break all the rules so I sort of in this this is actually sort of for me a sort of way to sort of uh, uh, rewrite the rules because uh, you cannot relate to anybody who did something with the system uh, uh, but and uh, to answer the question if I look at uh, other things outside of the design uh, in, in in some sense but it's more like this natural principles for for me but I think for, yeah, it's, it's different. Yeah, I mean, I think from, I mean, obviously the, the training that we've done, um, I think at a certain point is making connections for me that, that are like transcending the references and the history that we deal with is what's gonna make the work individual to you. So, or at least for me, you know, I think that's, and that's why it's so clear watching probably my presentation that like, I mean, out the gate at probably 16 years old, I knew that there was two parallel paths that were gonna converge. And so you understand, it, so knowing I come from music and also I think a lot of people don't know this, I come from like commercial production, motion graphics. I, I, I was working at places in just with D, Dima graduates in, in, in Venice Beach in, in the 2000s. So there's this huge animation background in the studio mixed with music, which graphic design that like hits so I think you know it makes it interesting to me to try to connect like a, a, a musical system with the design system because it's the same you know just like a progression you know like a chord progression looping is similar to just a set of keyframes or even like a, a for loop or some sort of behavior in code um, it's basically just this underlying structure that allows you to have fun or improvise just like you know in Daniel Daniel's work I've noticed you know just the that you could expand and contract that thing. There is like an underlying thing that holds it together, but allows you to improvise and have fun with it, which is very musical. It's like, a, it's a musical concept to me. So I like that kind of mixture. I think it's fun to find random connections with things and throw them together, but um, it's whatever works best for yourself at the end of the day, you know, but I don't get caught up looking too much Instagram. It's the most important stuff, I think. <laughs> All right, while I wait for some more questions, I'm gonna throw one in that I had myself. Since both of you um, are teaching or Daniel has taught um, and is not right now, um, what do you find most important for students? Like what's the emphasis now on teaching typography? One. Um, most important. Um, yeah, I think the, the most important thing is sort of to really sort of trust in your own instincts because I, I noticed that um, uh, in a lot of art schools, uh, sometimes it, it can be difficult to sort of uh, uh, feel really the, the freedom to sort of do what you want to do and, and sort of that you more think about. What, what the teachers will expect from you. So I think it's more sort of really trusting your own guts. Uh, that's what I would, would give as advice. Yeah, I think that's the same. I mean, I think there, while there's definitely some like practical things that, that I wanna make sure that 
you know, people can apply these to whatever projects they're going to do beyond um, the classroom. I think it's, it, it's the same question as before is like finding what makes it personal to you. And that's, what's going to make you stick with it. Like, why do you, why do you care about it? You know? And, and I think when, when you can connect it, like a lot of most designers, I know, like the, my favorite ones are the best ones all have like a, there's like some counterpoint. They're like great. They're really interested in photographer or writing or something else. There's, a, or they're like shooting films. There's always like a, there's always like a connected, like, artistic interest that gets combined that I think, you know, it, it is an important thing. Um, and, and, and that's obviously when you're young, you, you're still searching for these things, but I think, you know, the more like you start to understand that everything kind of fuses and connects. And then I think that's when I always say the best stuff comes together when the weirdest two things collide. And then it's like, Oh, like, wow, we're, that, that is genius stuff. Um, so to me, at least trying to, set some sort of formula or some sort of like process to get students to open their minds to that is very important for me. Um, I don't care at the end of the day if they don't like the fonts that I think they should use <laughs> so <laughs> and vice versa. But I, you know, I, I try to recommend like, here's some good quality stuff, but you know, you need to find what works best for the, themselves, I guess, but yeah. Oh, I wanna, maybe... yeah. oh go ahead. I know, I want to add to it, uh, when, when I was teaching, I was always uh, sort of doubting sometimes when I really liked the work of students. I, di I didn't know if they were really anarchistic or sort of really against the system or they were just really not informed. Uh, and, 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 and when I was on this border, sort of sort of breaking all the rules because I didn't know what the rules were <laughs> uh, or that they were breaking the rules, there, there were always the things that I still remember somehow that I, I think. Yeah. Yeah, the funny thing is I also am super attracted to what I have not seen before, which basically means they break all the rules, right? And now that um, we're more focused on not being so Eurocentric with our sources and um, it, it seems to open up what the possibilities can be for typography. And, and uh, I've seen, for instance, um, lecture series announcements for uh, non-white design designers. And the, the, the design was made by students that were non-white and they basically broke all the rules. And the first time you see that, you're like, what is this? And then there's, to me at least, an, an, an immediate liking to it, which, yeah. which asks the questions, how, how important is that knowledge that we still try to put in? It, and it's so funny to me, Mitch, that you're in Switzerland. Swiss typography is like this holy grail oh, I mean, thing. Well, that's, we need to have these discussions here. I mean, it's like, I, I, it's funny because I was essentially brought here to teach and I don't think they realized what was coming because <laughs> I'm kind <laughs> of like, you guys are fucking crazy with all this shit. Like, what are you doing? Like, like this is irrelevant to me, you know? And, and I come in here with this, you know, free flow jazzy stuff and it's not jazzy here. So, but it's, and, and, I, and I totally agree because like that is still canonized here. And I work with some of the people that are, are part of that. Like Francois Rappo did the typeface for Squarespace and he is pretty much the living example of it here, which I find really fascinating, but I feel like it's fun to destroy that too. I mean, and, and, and it's nice cause I, you know seeing colleagues and like you guys talk about this in the US and I'm like, God, you could really use that over here because it's still, it's still so like, so rigid and so, so like this is the way this is who's the best and I'm like no one cares <laughs> like there's other cooler shit out there like what the fuck are we doing sorry for my I get really passionate about this too because it does drive me a little crazy and but uh I don't know I mean I think yeah I think it's really important that we open up the the scope and, and just find these other influences it doesn't even necessarily be just just it, people we need to get out of this is the best or this is the important stuff like sure book typesetting 
comes out of a huge history of thousand years of printing and stuff and that's not going away but other aesthetics that come into it and other reasons why we make stuff come into it needs to be like embraced um and i and i have to deal with that challenge at school all the time because it's not always like that uh, right yeah a lot of the <laughs> i have a question from christopher uh to mitch in working in new spaces like AR and VR, what do you find are the most common pain points in working with type in 3D space? And what would you say are the most compelling opportunities? I think the first thing probably that's interesting here, and this again is breaking European tradition, is that the format's gone. So you lose the, the rectangle that we would set type size, set our letting size, do all that, it's gone. So then you have around HDRI, essentially, you have the world to work in. So then while that becomes much more challenging to managing text, it, like we don't have typefaces that deal with this curved curvature, look at like the worldview of a human being is not flat. So th that is a problem. And I think that's a very interesting thing, but I think what's good, you know, being comfortable in 3D software and not thinking of 3D software, but then you can kind of simulate some of these environments of maybe how does text read in sort of a non-format related area. So again, like type <laughs> animation is important. Like it has to come in from the left because we read this way. You can't animate from text from right and left unless it's Arabic because it's reading the directions the other way. So these, these things we need to understand, but we no longer have the page to do it for us. So then we have to, yeah, test it. So I think it's important that we prototype stuff in 3D and then you can show the examples and then do an AR or VR because you can't just design an AR or VR. Um, I think there's a lot of steps there. But anyway, it's technical, but uh, it does totally change how we think about type, period. All right, waiting for new questions. So I throw one in. Um, why? And I don't even know if it's true, but why are there not way more typographers for the screen? Like people who 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 really focuses on, focus on typography for websites, um, etc. Is that too new? I mean, there's we've won so much with screens having resolve the resolution uh, problem, right? Um, because it seems so, it seems like a smart thing to have people really specialize in screen typography. Why is I mean, it so hard to find people? We're always really limited, of course, with the with the technology. Like uh, a lot of the uh, the ways the websites are built are sort of still embedded in like the first prototypes, like the first CSS and HTML. And slowly you see that sort of the logic of how, uh, for instance, books or InDesign or how these programs work. Slowly the, these these kind of uh, systems are sort of being developed with uh, the update of CSS. But, but before everything of those uh, elements are sort of embedded, then you need to have like big corporations also updating their uh, their software or their like their, uh, so you sort of uh, really have to wait for all the super nice uh, 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 technology to finally arrive in the computers of, of, uh, of uh, tax offices <laughs> basically. And if that's the case, then I think uh, there's much more freedom to really start designing for typography, but I think it's already starting, but um, uh, but I think people are a bit behind the curve because uh, it was not really possible yet still. I think it's really sort of still evolving. Yeah, there's a, and there's a, there's, a, there's a gap between the education side of that. So I think we have these discussions now, but I think, you know, I'm still at school where, you know, mise en page is taught like traditional book designers are teaching the typography classes just the way it is. And I'm like, they, when people like, have a discussion about web design, it's like, dude, typography should be taught universally with both going on at the same time. I don't know why this is even a discussion. It's like, it's 2020. This should have been, this should have been settled in 98, you know? Um, so, I, but I do think there's just, a, a, there's always a little lag behind the, the technological progression and how we behave with work. And then, you know, how that starts to 
institutionalized within the academic environment and there's there's always a lag there and i think now things are moving so fast it's like you know finding the people to do that and, and changing the man in just the bureaucracy within like the you know the educational institution to get that shift is going to take some time unfortunately um which is a bit un it's it, it's frustrating for me because i like stuff to move fast but you know, seeing this and being in an academic side for a bit, it's, things don't move as fast as you want them to. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. I see no new questions. Please, people, if you have a question, put it in the chat. Did you guys know about each other's work before? I know Mitch's work. Yeah. Yeah, both. Yeah. Ah. I was actually uh, doing this workshop at Lausanne, and then I, and I think you were just were there before. So oh was, wow, uh, the students' work was exhibited there. Then <laughs> yeah, <That's> crazy. <laughs> just each other. Wow. Yeah. Nice. small world. This is a super <laughs> small world. So yeah, there's so many people that we ended up like knowing and stuff. It's like random. <laughs> yeah. I see um, one other question there about experimental pitching stuff. Oh yeah, Christopher, to both of you, in pitching clients new experimental solutions, how do you go about framing your solutions in the best way to get chosen? Uh, framing. Uh, you want to start, Mitch? Oh yeah, uh, yeah I can do this. Um, I think also we have a, a little bit of a luxury to having some precedence here. Um, I think to start the projects is, I, especially with the kind of work that we do, like these corporate and commercial rebrands, I think that the important thing is that when we have the initial conversations with the clients, we're not just showing them past case studies that we've done. They actually get to see the material that's the R&D and the experimentation and stuff that we're doing regardless. So that becomes starting points for oh, this could, we could see this scale or we could see this be implemented in a way or we could see this thing transferred in some way. So having a, a personal library of the studio's research to then talk about potential clients with makes it very easy to set up this situation because they're not, they're no longer referencing like a, you know, a mood board on Pinterest or this and that. They're, they're basing our initial conversation on stuff that we've already done on a research standpoint. So at that point, then they know what they're going to expect. It's not going to be that radical or very experimental because they've already seen basically things that we've already thought about and dealt with. But then we're trying to think about it under the, the framework or lens of a st strategy or client brief or very specific business goals that we're trying to meet within that. And then it becomes a bit more scaled and commercially minded sometimes. But um, it, I, I think it reduces the experimental quality because you're able to show that that thing is actually quite scalable as an idea outside of just a little sketch. Um, but I think that's probably the one thing I recommend everybody to do is to just save everything they do in their entire career and then be able to pull it up at any time, no matter if it was a just a sketch for a project or just a killed idea from a client, that always can be come back up like, oh yeah, there's this thing. And then you become to then you can just use your own work as your resource material for, for future commissions. And I think that's, that's how we manage the situation. That's really funny to hear to me that you have exactly the same sort of approach. Uh, and, and, it, and because I, I think people are used to be quite really ne negative about this, this, this method of working. And, it, and if I talked about it, people are saying, like, you, you're sort of reusing work? Because of course, yeah, because I can spend like all the freedom without any limitations on sort of doing what I would love. And then, and, and then somehow at one point you find a match. I was actually exactly. uh, talking the other day with uh, Tim Rodebrucker is also a coder and designer, uh, and uh, he had he made sort of um, he made a design for the New York Times, like a big uh, screen. And then I said, "How how does this design way go?" And he said, "Like yeah, nowadays it also goes like they see something they like that you made, and they ask, can you make, can you develop on this?' Because we have such short time, there's like a couple of days." And this is really good. So uh, you cannot come up with something this good in, in like this, this short time. Uh, so uh, I really like the fact that you sort of produce work without a client uh, and that you also show it. 
because before then you just show your portfolio and people would say like, I want what you did for this other client. I want it too. <laughs> and he yes. said, yeah, it's not possible because I made it for his clients. So this, uh, this, this sort of new approach, I'm really liking it. So, so th therein lies like the danger too. There's like, to, there's the perfect amount of showing just enough because yeah. if you show too much or show everything, then everybody's just going to ask you to recreate it. So it's all, yeah. And we've dealt with, this is a constant battle in the studio. It's like, we don't sh actually show much public R&D anymore. We actually kind of stop, but you only see it in lectures. Like you'll yeah. see it in, you'll see it in the context of maybe a lecture, like a promotion or something, but it's usually some practical piece of like content and never just free. But I think also like we're doing such, it's like very commercially, you know, like branding projects and stuff for, for companies. So it's like this weird, <laughs> This, you're weird that someone else is just going to grab one of those ideas and purpose it for their project. And then you can see that, that where that influence came from. So we got kind of maybe uh, paranoid. And <laughs> no, but, but it's based on, on, on facts. It, it happened before for you. Or... Yeah, but I think but there, the, there's a nice line. But you know, like you have this meeting, then you can open up the keynote just like this presentation and just unload. And all this yeah. material that doesn't live on Instagram, but you have it, you know, it's kind of like, we have this Pandora's box and stuff. Yeah. 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 But yeah. you have a, yeah. But it can also be the other way around. I also have like, uh, I had uh, did research for certain methods and then I, uh, and then suddenly saw like other designers doing exactly the same thing. And I thought I did, I, uh, that sounds arrogant, but I, I came up with it four years ago, but I put it in a folder. What the fuck? <laughs> Throughout my career, I kept a drawer with all the rejected proposals. <laughs> and somehow that drawer is of weird value to me. Like, yeah, maybe the ideas were too crazy or insane or impossible. But still, um, and John Sueda, as you know, you know, curated that exhibition on impossible ideas, right? So he actually yeah. went through that drawer and was like, oh, can I show this? Can I show that? And it's weird because you're, um, I feel kind of protective about those ideas and to have it then up on a museum wall is kind of awkward. Also because they're your failures in a way. <laughs> so, yeah. all right, I don't see any new questions. Last chance, people. I can't thank you both enough for having shown your work. I thought it was great. Um, it's probably the only positive thing about this whole COVID-19 case that we can actually talk to people abroad um, because flying them in is usually too expensive or whatever. So, um, and I also wanted to present to people in the hopes that they might know each other's work, but also to see similarities or differences and uh, keep up the great work. I think it's exciting. Thank you very much for inviting us in. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, it was great. Mm -hmm. And uh, we should have a longer talk about the, the future of uh, typography. There's certainly a, a, like another hour's worth of forum content that could be, uh, <laughs> could be added here for sure. <laughs> All right, Garrett, how do we end this? <laughs> it's always a good question. Um, I mean, I just wanted to say thank you. It was very inspirational. Uh, I love how free flowing you are with your designs. It's just really inspiring to see that kind of uh, unrestrained experimentation. I think it's uh, something that I would like to employ in my own work. Um, but yeah, to end it, I mean, I just hit the end button and, and we all, all right. go. <laughs>